This is a true story. The reconstructions are based on original cockpit voice recordings and eyewitness accounts. No family wants to lose a loved one, daughter, son. None of us think it's going to happen to our family. We read about these horrible crashes and we think, thank God, you know, and chances are it won't happen to us. The odds are in our favor. In January 2000, an Air Alaska jet with 88 passengers and crew suffered a catastrophic failure that tore it from the sky. A shocking chain of negligence and error had led to disaster. When a whistleblower mechanic from the airline tried to sound the alarm about faulty maintenance procedures, he was suspended from his job. The investigation exposes deeply worrying shortcomings in maintenance and regulation that afflict the airline industry. It shows how a series of devastating errors combined to produce a tragic accident, one that could happen again. Release it! Puerto Vallarta is a popular holiday resort on the Mexican Pacific coast, one of several Mexican destinations served by Alaska Airlines. Colleen Worley went there to celebrate a family birthday. The 34-year-old was a keen traveler who spoke Spanish well and had visited Mexico many times. Colleen and the other holidaymakers returning from Puerto Vallarta settle in for the four-hour flight to San Francisco. In the warm afterglow of their holidays, they are looking to the future. Colleen and her fiancé, Monty, were planning to start a family later that year. The pilots on Flight 261 are very experienced. Both Captain Ted Thompson and First Officer Bill Tansky have thousands of hours flying MD-80s. They know the plane well. The MD-83 is one of a successful group of rear-engined low-wing planes. Originally launched in 1980, over 1,100 were delivered worldwide. Flaps. Check confirmed. Spoilers. Check. Arm. But on the 31st of January 2000, as they prepared Flight 261, Thompson and Tansky had no idea that deep in the plane's tail lay a critical weakness. Colleen Worley and her fiancé, Monty, were planning their forthcoming wedding. They had announced their engagement at Christmas time, and so it was um, a time for everybody to sort of congratulate them, and so we decided we'd have a party for the family. Abby Miller Bush had visited Mexico with her husband, Ryan, and their friends to celebrate her new job at Microsoft. It's hard to describe. how joyful a girl she was. She was well known for that care that she had in her, a trait that you can't put a value on. Dean and I had been there a lot together, and it was the first time that he went without me. Dean taught me how to play. 
He was always up. He told jokes a lot. People described him kind of as a puppy dog. Alaska Airlines was a successful carrier with routes up and down the west coast of America and into Mexico. Flight 261 left Puerto Vallarta as a routine flight with no hint of the danger to come. The devastating failure that would bring catastrophe to Flight 261 did not come out of the blue. In fact, it was the culmination of a chain of mistakes that began years earlier. Maintenance procedures at the company had come under scrutiny two years earlier when a whistleblower set off an investigation by the Federal Aviation Administration. But the day Flight 261 left Puerto Vallarta, the investigation was still underway and the whistleblower suspended from his work. Shortly after takeoff, Captain Thompson and First Officer Tansky get the first sign of trouble. The horizontal stabilizer on the tailplane won't move. The pilots carry out a standard checklist to try and free it. Stabilizer trim switch. Normal. Circuit breakers. Reset if tripped. D9, D10, D11, okay. The stabilizer on the MD-83 is the 40-foot wide horizontal surface at the front of the tail. It's like another wing. Together with the elevators at the rear of the tail, the stabilizer is used to adjust the angle of the plane in flight. The stabilizer was jammed. Thompson and Tansky assume there was a fault in the electric motors that move it up and down. They believe they could fix the problem. They had no idea they were in great danger. What they dealt with was something that, that really snuck up on them. It, it was not supposed to be a big deal. If it had been, they would have turned around and gone back in to the Mexican airfield they came out of. Uh, but they were led down this road of accepting this problem as a small problem, so it's perfectly all right to troubleshoot him. The pilots repeatedly try the two switches that operate the stabilizer. The primary motor activated by the switch on the control stick known as the pickle switch and the sliding suitcase handles on the central console. Either system operative. No. Both systems inoperative. Consider stab jam. Do not use autopilot. Check. The jammed stabilizer is pushing the aircraft down towards the ground. At 28,500 feet, the pilots switch off the autopilot and fly the plane manually. They have to pull back hard on the control column to lift the nose of the plane up. This requires considerable effort. The plane climbs for the next seven minutes to its cruising altitude of 32,000 feet. As they fly up the coast, the pilots contact Alaska Maintenance Department for assistance. Maintenance, we need to know if any faults like this got reported recently for this aircraft. Whether there are any switches that we might not be aware of that can get those motors turning again? Roger, 261. I can verify no history on your aircraft in the past 30 days. Yeah, we didn't see anything in the logbook. Why don't you move your seat forward? I'll check this pedestal back there. Beyond that, I don't think there's anything we haven't checked. I use the example of the, the average layman, I think, can understand. If you try your... Uh, to start your car and it doesn't crank, you try jiggling the, the key in the socket and then try it again. And I think that the crew was probably understandably going through a lot of these, well, maybe it'll work now, or let's try this, let's try that. The pilots want to divert to Los Angeles, but Alaska Airlines dispatch, coordinating the movements of the company's planes, is worried this will upset the busy schedule. 261 dispatch, uh, if you want to land at L.A., of course, for safety reasons, we will do that. Uh, tell you, though, if we land in L.A., uh, we're looking at probably an hour, an hour and a half. We've got a major flow program going right now. Well, boy, you really put me in a spot up here. I don't want to hear that the flow is the reason you're calling. Because I'm concerned about overflying suitable airports. Well, we want to do uh, what's safe, so if that's what you feel is safe, uh, just want to make sure you have all the info. We might ask if they have a ground school instructor available. We could discuss it with him and a simulator instructor. 
Dispatch 261. We're wondering if we can get some support at the, out of the instructors up there. Thompson and Tansky now ask for a pilot instructor who might know the solution to their unusual problem. Stand by. As they wait for a reply, their frustration begins to show. drives me nuts, you know? Not that I want to go on about it, but it just blows me away. They think we're going to land, they're going to fix it. Now they're worried about the flow. Well, I'm sorry. Just... So they're putting pressure on you? Well, no. Yeah. The pilots need to think about what will happen when they descend for landing. How will the plane behave? Will they be able to control it? But several minutes after requesting help from the ground, they're getting no advice. As Flight 261 approached Los Angeles off the coast, the problems on board were about to get far worse. Pilots on the crippled Air Alaska Flight 261 are flying manually at 32,000 feet in a plane that has a jam stabilizer that is forcing the plane's nose down. The pilots have another go at freeing up the jam stabilizer. They switch on both the electric motors that control it. This will click it off. Thousand feet, flight 261 plunges down for over a minute. The crew battle for control. It just stopped, it's okay. You're stalled. At first, they pull back on the control columns to fight the dive. But then the pilots push the aircraft's nose down into the dive to regain control. It's a risky maneuver pushing the plane's speed to 350 miles an hour. You gotta release it, you gotta release it. The pilots slowly bring the plane out of its dive and back under control. <laughs> Let's get speed brakes. Give me high pressure pumps. Okay. Help me back. Help me back. Okay. Center Alaska 261. We're in a dive here. I've lost control. Vertical pitch. Alaska 261, say again, sir. Yeah, we're out of uh, 26,000 feet. We are in a vertical dive. Not a dive yet, but we have lost vertical control of our airplane. Just help me. Once we get the speed slow, maybe we'll be okay. Maintaining level flight is difficult. The jam stabilizer keeps pushing the nose of the plane down. We're at 23.7. Request. Yeah, we got it under control here. No, we don't. Okay. Okay. To counteract the downward force of the stabilizer, the pilots use the elevators, movable panels at the back of the tail, linked by cable to the control column. The pilots pull with all their might. The fate of the plane hangs on the strength of their arms. In the cabin, frightened passengers try to recover from the terrifying plunge. They have no idea what might happen next. Holiday memories are replaced by the fear of dying. Dean was one of these people who would talk to whoever was around him. I'm absolutely certain that, that he was talking to the person that was sitting next to him on the plane. I'm sure that they had a connection. 
Halloween was very unique from my other kids, and she loved to travel. She was um, a beautiful girl. But here was a 25-year-old who was like she had her own private rocket ship. She was really going places. In the cockpit, the pilots struggle to control the plane's speed so they can land. They've got a handful of airplanes. They get her stabilized, and they're now in, in a situation where they make the decision properly to go in on an emergency landing to Los Angeles International. And they, they have to be able to slow the airplane up, so you've got to experiment a little bit. Let's take the speed brakes off. No, no, leave them there. It seems to be helping. Damn. OK, it really wants to pitch down. OK. Don't mess with that. I agree with you. With the plane under temporary control, the crew make the fateful decision to do more troubleshooting. They need a block of clear space around the aircraft in case they lose control again. They contact air traffic control. Alaska 261, say your conditions. 261, we are at 24,000 feet, kind of stabilized. We're slowing down here, we're, and we're going to do a, a little troubleshooting. Can you give me a block altitude between 20 and 25? Alaska 261, maintain block altitude, flight level 200 through flight level 250. The pilots know they now have clear airspace above and below the plane. They try to figure out their next move. You got the airplane. Let me just try it. OK. How hard is it? I don't know. My adrenaline's going. It was really rough back there for a while. Yeah, it is. Whatever we did is no good. Let's not do that again. Yeah, it went to down, to full nose down. It's worse than it was before? Yeah, we're in much worse shape now. The crew know this is no mere electrical problem. From what they've experienced, they assume the stabilizer is now jammed. I think it's at the stop, full stop. And I'm thinking, can it get any worse? I probably can, but let's slow it. Let's get down to 200 knots and, and see what happens. The crisis is getting worse. Uncertain how the plane will react if they try to slow it down, the pilots must still pull on the elevators to maintain level flight. Captain Thompson once again tries to get help from maintenance. Maintenance, 261, are you on? Yeah, 261, this is maintenance. OK, we did both the pickle switch and the suitcase handles, and it ran, ran away. It ran away full nose, trimmed down. Oh, it ran away, trimmed down? OK, and now we're in a damp pinch, and we're holding. We're worse than we were before. You're getting full nose trimmed down, but you don't get no nose trim up. Is that correct? That's a firm. We went to full nose down, and I'm afraid to try it again to see if it would go in the other direction. OK, well, your discretion. Uh, if you want to try it, that's OK with me. If not, that's fine. See you at the gate. As important as it is to have that ground contact with, uh, with people with maintenance manuals and experience on the ground and the ability to call up the manufacturer, it's not always going to give you a magic answer. The crew had already gone through every logic tree they possibly could think of. Maintenance clearly do not appreciate the gravity of the situation. This is the last the crew will hear from them. No one can help the pilots now as they struggle with the plane's faulty stabilizer. Ever professional, however, they try to put the passengers at ease. Folks, uh, we have had a flight control problem up front here. We're working it. Uh, that's Los Angeles off to the right there, and that's where we're intended to go. We're pretty busy up here working this situation. I don't anticipate any big problems once we get a couple of subsystems on the line. But we will be going into LAX, and I anticipate us parking there in about 20 to 30 minutes. In fact, they will never make it to Los Angeles. A full-blown disaster is about to unfold. <laughs> 
After the terrifying 8,000 feet plunge downwards, Alaska 261 has now leveled out. LA, Alaska 261, we're with you. We're at 22.5, we have a jam stabilizer, and we're maintaining altitude with difficulty. But uh, we can maintain altitude, we think, and our intention is to land at Los Angeles. The pilots request to be routed out over the Pacific Ocean. Center uh, Alaska 261, I, I need to get down about 10, change my configurations to make sure I can control the jet, and I'd like to do that over the bay here, if I may. If the worst happens, they don't want to kill people on the ground as well as in the plane. There are a lot of lives saved that people maybe don't realize by the fact that this air crew said, let's stay out over the water until we've got this thing completely under control. As they maneuver over the ocean, the crew again ask air traffic control for clear space around the plane. Alaska 261, fly a heading of 280 and descend and maintain 17,000. 280 and 17, 17,000, Alaska 261. And we're generally needing a block altitude. Alaska 261, Roger. I need everything picked up and everybody strapped down. Because I'm going to unload the aircraft and see if we can regain control that way. The pilots concentrate on trying to fix the plane. I'm test flying now. How's it feel? It's wanting to pitch over more. Really? Yep. Try flaps? 15? 11? Now let's go to 11. Okay, get some power on. Uh, I'm at 250 knots. Real hard? Well, actually, it's pretty stable right here, see, but we got to get it down to 180. The crew try to slow the aircraft down to landing speed without losing control. But every move they make could have fatal consequences. OK, bring the, the flaps and the slats back up for me. Slats too? Yeah. Treading a knife edge of control, the pilots are still trying to free up the stabilizer. What I want to do is, is get the nose up, and then let the nose fall through and see if we can stab it when it's unloaded. The only hope for the passengers is that the pilot's skill and experience can get the plane to Los Angeles airport. It's on the stop now, it's on the stop. Not according to this, it's not. As one effort after another fails, the crew wonder if the stabilizer is damaged. The trim might be, and then it might be if uh, something's popped back there. Yeah. It might be mechanical damage too. I think if it's controllable, we ought to just try and land it. Think so? Okay, let's head for LA. But just as they prepare the plane to land in Los Angeles, something in the tail suddenly breaks. Did you feel that? Yep. Okay, give me slats. This is a bitch. Is it? Yep. Yeah. The plane dives straight down from 18,000 feet. <laughs> to avoid collisions, Los Angeles Control has warned the pilots of nearby planes that Alaska 261 is in difficulty. These pilots now report back to the tower. That plane has just started to do a big, huge plunge. Yep! Definitely, and I know it's down position descending quite rapidly. Definitely out of control. Ah. Plane hit earnest there. Okay. Yeah, he's a good The pilots can barely reach the controls. The plane is now upside down, but they believe they might be able to roll it out of the dive. They tried to fly the airplane even upside down. They never for a moment believed that they could not find a way to control this airplane. Push and pushing. OK, let's kick rudder. It's left rudder. Left rudder. Can't reach it. OK. Right rudder. Right rudder. Ah. 
plane was being knocked from side to side. It turned upside down. It was spinning. Persons were being thrown against the walls of the plane, falling out of their seats, and the cockpit voice recorder screaming. Um, un unbelievable, uh, horrible last few minutes of their lives. Are we flying? We're flying. We're flying. Tell them what we're doing. Let me just. Ah, damn. At least upside down. We're flying. Yeah. And it was so violently upside down that the pilots were hanging from their shoulder straps. Passengers don't have shoulder straps. After a terrifying 60-second dive, Flight 261 hit the Pacific Ocean at over 250 miles an hour. Rescue helicopters were soon at the crash site, but there were no survivors. The plane had broken up on impact. 88 passengers and crew, including three young children, died instantly. Fred Miller lost his daughter, Abby, and her husband, Ryan. These people suffered on the way down. This was not a pretty way to die. One witness who I met, a jogger on the beach down at Port Wainami, he said, you look like you lost somebody. And I said, I did, my daughter. He said, you know, I saw the plane go down. He said the plane was inverted and twisting and flipping and and then he said it spun at times, almost like a top. And he said, to thank people, somebody who has a life to li live is in there, dying. He said, he said, he says it's one of the most horrifying memories I'll ever have. Susan De Silva lost her husband, Dean. I know that they went through a horrible, horrible experience. It, this was a violent end these people suffered. There were no bodies that were in, intact or even close to intact. And they were conscious for a long time before it all came apart. Colleen Worley died along with her fiance, Monty. As a mother, Keep waiting for your for your child to come home. And Colleen had traveled so much in her in her life that it was it was unusual not to have her just walk in the door. All this time you you're thinking something caused this, something made this happen, and I want to find out who's responsible for this. The investigation into Flight 261 immediately got underway, but the wreckage lay 700 feet down, so National Transportation Board officials called on Navy submersibles to retrieve the debris from the seabed. We set up a base of operations, and we had a remote operating vehicle with the side-scanning sonar, which they used to map the debris field and get an idea of how widely spread the wreckage was. At the National Transportation Safety Board headquarters in Washington, the investigators' immediate concern was to find out what had brought the plane down. The first clues came from the cockpit voice recordings. LA, Alaska 261, we're with you. We're at 22.5, we have a jam stabilizer, and we're maintaining altitude with difficulty. We immediately suspected some problem in the tail of the airplane. 
which is where the controls are. There's something was wrong back there, and that was the key piece of wreckage to look for. The MD-83 that crashed was a revised version of the Douglas Corporation's popular DC-9, over 2,000 of which were delivered to airlines worldwide. The engines were at the rear, and the distinctive T-shaped tail was an essential element of the design. In a big turbojet aircraft, one of the rather brilliant elements of the design is that since you're going to be loading passengers and cargo, you want to be able to have that aircraft loaded a little nose heavy or a little tail heavy. Well, in order to do that, you had to, actually had to have that entire stabilizer moving. But the ones that are the most difficult to engineer are the T-tailed airplanes, where you have the vertical stabilizer and the horizontal sitting on top. And we call that stabilizer trim. And that is an essential element of what makes these aircraft so usable. In the MD-83, a motorized jack screw in the tail moves the horizontal stabilizer up and down. As the stabilizer moves up, the nose of the plane moves down. As the stabilizer moves down, the nose moves up. But what role have the two-foot jack screw played in the loss of Flight 261? The investigators were anxious to inspect it as soon as it was recovered from the seabed. The jack screw wasn't mated with the nut that it screws into. It was just by itself. And the nut was found in another piece of structure a few feet away from where the jack screw was. To have a screw separate itself from a, from a nut with very thick threads surprised us. Secondly, we noticed that there was a curled piece of brass around the jack screw. And all of the threads that you can see here, these ridges, were gone. They had been stripped out and the remnants of those were found coiled on the jack screw. Once the thread had been stripped off the nut, the jack screw could no longer turn. The pilots could not have known the real nature of the problem. The crew was confronted uh, with a situation that had never occurred before. There is no failed jack screw <laughs> procedure in the quick reference handbooks that they have available. There is no training for it. When the jack screw jammed, the crew were unable to adjust the stabilizer. We felt that it was due to the fact that these nut threads had worn away and it was just too hard for that jack screw under the power of the electric motor to turn. That gave the flight crew an indication that there was a problem. The crew knew they had a problem in the tailplane, but they had no idea what. Two motors controlled the jack screw. They tried each in turn, but the pilots' attempts to free the jam stabilizer inadvertently made their situation worse. We're at 23-7. Request. Yeah, we got it under control here. No, we don't. Where they went wrong was that they wanted to try both the alternate and the primary trim motors at the same time. When the pilots switched both the electric motors on, the jack screw moved, but the threads had given way and the jack screw was now held only by a single retaining nut. From here on, the plane was doomed. That end nut was never designed to hold the loads generated aerodynamically by the airplane. Get speed brakes. Give me high pressure pumps. Okay. Now we know, back. in the glaring light of hindsight, now when we turn the situation around in time and look back, we can see that this air crew and no air crew should have ever been fooling with the trim and trying to run it back and forth. The retaining nut grew weaker and weaker. Then, finally, through the loads beating down on that nut, the nut finally failed. Feel that? Yep. OK, give me slacks. The jack screw slid completely out of the Acme nut, allowing the horizontal stabilizer to move well beyond its aerodynamic limits. This is a bitch. Is it? Yeah. The stabilizer forced the plane down. And now, completely out of control, it rolled over into its final dive. OK, let's keep runner. Slump runner. Up runner. I can't reach it. The 
Bell's crew was working to recover the aircraft right down to the water. I mean, they did not give up the whole way down through the descent. It was clear to the investigators that the failure of the jack screw was the only explanation for the plane's erratic flight path and final dive. But why had this happened? Why had the jack screw failed? The investigators began looking deeper and deeper into the condition of the faulty jack screw on flight 261 what had caused it to fail. There was no lubrication or visible grease uh, on the working area of the screw. That was uh, surprising and strange. The discovery of no grease on the jack screw alarmed the investigators. They alerted the Federal Aviation Administration, who ordered an immediate check on all MD-80s in the USA. This led to a shocking discovery. At Alaska Airlines, in six of its fleet of 34 planes, the jack screw assembly needed to be replaced after failing new inspections. No grease is the culprit. No grease or inadequate grease is the only thing that can give you that wear rate. A simple lack of grease led to the failure of the jack screw and the loss of 88 lives. But why did this happen at Alaska Airlines? The investigator's attention now switched to the company's maintenance program. What emerged was deeply worrying. We interviewed all the mechanics who had worked on these airplanes. We knew that they had been falsifying records or not doing the work they had indicated. The mechanics at Alaska complained that they were pressured to keep the planes in the air or that their recommendations were overruled by supervisors. Some alleged that records were altered to show work done that was not done. Alaska has long been one of America's most successful airlines, but in the early 1990s, the economic downturn hit the company hard. Its response was to slash costs to revive its fortunes. Pilots, maintenance workers, management and others had to make sacrifices. Jobs were lost, pay was cut, and every hour aircraft spent on the ground was seen as waste. Two years of aggressive axe wielding saw costs come down by $80 million. Profits leapt. It was a corporate triumph. In Alaska's case in the early 90s, this airline had to do a, an incredible job of reforming itself from a fairly high cost carrier to a lower cost carrier that could compete head on with Southwest Airlines and with others. And they did it. They did it brilliantly. Uh, nobody really believed that it could happen. Alaska Airlines began flying the planes more intensively. It doubled the average daily use of its fleet. But keeping the planes in the air earning money put maintenance schedules under pressure. John Leotine was a former lead mechanic at Alaska Airlines Oakland Maintenance Facility, where he worked for over eight years. Leotine felt that the new pressures on maintenance put passengers' lives at risk. He was to pay dearly for expressing those concerns. We have used an actor to portray his experiences based on his sworn evidence to the NTSB. Leotine claimed that planes were pushed back into service too quickly. Sometimes, rather than wait for a replacement part or repair, supervisors pass planes fit for service free to carry passengers up into the air. In October 1998, 
over 15 months before the crash. John Leotine became so worried that he did something that would change his life forever. He reported Alaska Airlines to the US Department of Transportation, alleging violations in maintenance procedures. There were very few voices at Alaska who had concerns about the maintenance. There should have been more and there should have been people listening. John Leotine is a hero in my book. In December 1999, over a year before the crash, the FAA and Department of Transportation officials moved on Alaska Airlines. The case was referred to federal prosecutors, and the FBI raided Alaska's maintenance facilities and seized thousands of records. The raid was the opening shot in a federal grand jury investigation that would last three years. No criminal charges were brought against the airline. Alaska officials denied that any unsafe planes were put into service or that passengers' lives were ever at risk. But the investigation revealed hundreds of violations of federal regulations. Alaska Airlines was fined. The FAA insisted on changes to the company's maintenance and safety procedures. The FAA also suspended two supervisors for falsifying records. Like other whistleblowers, John Leotine would pay heavily for his efforts to save lives. Alaska put him on paid leave from his job losing him thousands of dollars in regular overtime earnings. Then in January 2000, John Leotine saw his worst nightmare come true. The kind of accident he had tried to prevent now took place just off the California coast. After the loss of Flight 261, Leotine went back to his private work records. Incredibly, he found he had a direct link to the crashed airliner. Two years before, at the plane's last overhaul, he had ordered that the jack screw on this very aircraft be replaced. He then went off shift. When investigators examined the record, they found that Leotine's recommendation had been overruled by the next shift and the plane put back into service. It would be two years before the next overhaul, but time ran out. Four months before the overhaul was due, Flight 261 crashed. Alaska Airlines labeled Leotine a disruptive influence. He sued the company for libel. Alaska settled, but Leotine could no longer work in the industry he loved. I get calls almost every week of somebody saying, should I blow the whistle? And I always tell them, you need to know, you need to be prepared to find another line of work because you will not work in the industry and you will not work in the government. In most cases, it's almost impossible to be a whistleblower and survive your career. As the investigators continued their work into Flight 261, they made another disturbing discovery about the drive to cut costs at Alaska Airlines. To keep planes flying more intensively, Alaska had dramatically extended the intervals between service. This was significant because when a plane is designed, every part has a schedule listing when it is serviced and when it must be replaced. You're supposed to go in and inspect 
every so many hours, and that's different on parts all over the planes. Some things you have to look at after every flight. Other things have to be inspected every two or three days. In 1996, Alaska Airlines extended the intervals between MD-80 jack screw inspections by 400%. Before 1996, jack screws were inspected every 600 flight hours. Now, there was over 2,500 hours between each service. If you had 600 hours between inspection points and greasing points, we have no chance of ever having a metal-to-metal -metal contact situation. But if you put that out to 2,000 hours or 2,500 hours, now what you do is eat into some of these protective stages, these barriers that we have towards uh, catastrophic failure. Division. In its final report into the crash of Flight 261, the NTSB concluded that the extended service intervals for the jack screws on its MD-80s was a significant contributor to the crash. With carriers doing anything to save a dime, uh, maintenance, safety, took a back seat. And then one of the shocking things about Alaska is that they were allowed to increase inspection intervals. And it was very shocking because that is the only way we have safety. The extended maintenance intervals meant that the lack of grease on the jack screw went undiscovered. But now investigators also wondered if the failure of the jack screw assembly revealed a basic flaw in the plane's design. They found that the MD-80 broke one of the fundamental rules of aircraft design. It was not fail-safe. The design philosophy that has made aviation so safe is that we should never ever have a situation in which one catastrophic failure of some component of the airplane causes us to lose the airplane. These backups to the backup backing up the backups is why we can get on an airplane with almost 100% assurance that we're going to get where we want to go safely there was no backup to the jack screw in its nut. Engineers never envisaged a situation on the MD-80 where the jack screw might fail. With inspections every 600 flight hours and replacement every 2,000 hours, the designers did not add an additional redundant backup system. It was utterly laughable that they said it was a redundant system. There's one screw and there's one nut. That's all there is, it's not redundant. The MD-80 continues to fly worldwide. Despite the revelation of this dangerous design flaw, the jack screw assembly has not been redesigned. Inspection intervals have been shortened, but airlines still rely on proper maintenance to prevent the same accident happening again. Investigations division. In its final report, the National Transportation Safety Board concluded that the crash of Flight 261 was due to the lack of adequate greasing and the stretched service intervals. When coupled with the design of the jack screw, these failures led to a completely avoidable accident and the loss of 88 lives. Three years after the crash of Flight 261, the relatives and friends of the dead dedicated a permanent memorial at Port Wanimi, close to the crash site. Janice Stokes. I think the, the best thing and the only thing in our infinite inadequacy of making up for the loss from this life is to say something that we've been able to say on a lot of other accidents to other grieving families, and that is, those deaths will not be in vain. We will not let them be in vain. Every one of those lies will be made to count in terms of making sure that three, four, five, or 10 other people do not die. Ms. Carol Carlson. Colleen was different. She was adventurous, and there's nobody like that in our family. Um, and. I don't know what we can do except to remember Colleen and to live our lives now a little bit better for her.
You know, when I was growing up, we didn't wear seatbelts. There weren't even seatbelts in cars. <laughs> and now we know that we need to wear our seatbelts. We didn't know that much about smoking cigarettes. And now we know that we can't smoke cigarettes. Well, there's a lot to learn about airline safety, too. Ryan Bushy. None of us are the same anymore. It's like walking into a giant storm, wave after wave forming up, coming in, because it never stops. Uh, grief over the loss of a child is not something I wish on anybody. This plane went down because of neglect. It seems like such an unholy type of loss. What a hard way to die. So an airline can, you know, make more money.